Je suis fier de faire partie de cette équipe et en tout état de cause, je vous remercie d'avoir répondu présent à, 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 notre, à nos invitations. Nous allons ouvrir les travaux par deux conférences académiques. J'appellerai pour commencer Madame Nora Bateson et M. Callaghan qui va nous présenter qui est Madame Bateson. M. Callaghan est le fondateur et le directeur de Global Vision Foundation et Mme Nora Bateson, présidente d'International Bateson Institute. Cette conférence sera en anglais et euh, dans tous les cas disponible puisque l'ensemble euh, de nos interventions en grand amphi euh, sera filmé. Mme Bateson, M. Callaghan. Je vais parler en, en anglais parce que Mme Bateson est plus confortable en parlant anglais. C'est un très grand plaisir pour moi d'introduire mon ami et collègue Nora Bateson. Comment connecter sa présence ici avec le purpose de cette discussion aujourd'hui Je voudrais vous suivre sur la citation de M. Fulmy que M. Fulmy a juste fait. Uh, talking about Confucius. There's a, a marvelous story from China, eight, eight, 800 BC or something of that period, where Confucius had a problem governing his empire that had many different ethnic groups in different provinces and regions. And his, big, his biggest question was how to identify the characteristics of governors. What type of personality would be the best form of governor? because there were no fax machines, there was no telephone, there was no internet, and the governors had to be able to respond to crises by themselves without consulting. And he hired Confucius as a consultant. And Confucius spent a year meeting all the governors, and when he came back, the emperor said, well, what's your advice? And he said, the best form of governor is somebody who will inspire the people with a common goal, because when people share a common goal, their natural tendency is to cooperate, to realize it. So, when we think of the problem of governance on this complicated planet with all these different pressure groups and industries and, and uh, nations and lobbies and issues that all coincide and, and so on, one of the most fruitful areas of hope is this new language of systems theory, uh, of a systemic understanding that enables groups to talk to each other and people in different disciplines to use the same vocabulary to start to identify fundamental principles of governance. And to cut a long story short, uh, Nora is, uh, is from a tradition inherited from her father, the great anthropologist Gregory Bateson, who was one of the leading thinkers about governance, inspired very much by how living systems govern themselves, how biological organisms and, and societies and ecosystems manage to maintain stability and what can we learn from them to manage our global and local governance and our institutional governance. So it's with great pleasure that I hand the mic to my friend Nora. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you, and um, thank you to all who have put this together. Uh, this is a wonderful convening of minds and hearts and hopes um, in an important moment in human history. Uh, we are here because we would like to do this better. Um, I think that that is a, an oversimplification, but indeed, I think it's, it matters. Um, I want to start today by addressing the fact that in every direction, we are facing one crisis or another. We're, we're pretty familiar with this. From teenagers who are dealing with eating disorders to 
large immigration groups, to ecological disasters, to religious conflict, to economic volatility, etc. I don't need to list this. You, you're well aware of it. And in our hunt, in our search for solutions to these problems, we very often short circuit our ability to see the complexity and interact with the complexity in which these situations emerge. Even the question, what is the solution, is a short circuiting of that perception. What do I mean by that? We live in a world that loves action. We want to take action. But what informs our action? Under what circumstances do we choose one action over another? What's behind that? Well, behind what we do is what we saw, what we perceived would be the right thing to do is our calibration of the information we had into an idea, this is what we should do. Right? So our actions really are a product of our perception. So when we go looking at all the actions we take to solve complex problems, I think that it's a good idea to take a step back for a moment and ask ourselves first, what did we perceive the issue to be? Did we give it the complexity that it deserved? Have we considered the actual dynamics and the interrelationships that this situation has taken place in? So that's what I want to talk to you about today. Um, and complexity, even just to say the word, we think maybe, oh, there's so many interrelationships and interconnections, we can't take them all into consideration, our heads will explode, right? No one person can do that. No ministry can do that. And I think you're right. But we can do better. And that's what we're here for. So it's not impossible. And that's the first thing, after not having enough coffee and beginning to talk about complexity too early in the morning, that we should consider. I wanted to start today with um, Monet. Uh, Monet, it turns out, was a systems thinker. Somehow, Monet was able to take these seemingly abstract and unintelligible brush strokes up close and create a context in which those brush strokes carried a kind of light and life that made sense. I mean, we, we've all seen a Monet. You go up close and it doesn't there's nothing there. You step back and you see this incredible thing. Now, Monet did not have 30 foot paint brushes. Let's see, 10 meter paint brushes. How did he do that? How did he address those very minute details up close, which is what we have to do day in and day out with the details of our lives, in such a way that they were coherent in a larger context. How did he know? And how can we begin to think like Monet, to see like Monet? Okay. The big question for us in governance, in education, in communication, in media, can you read this? It's all clear, right? How do we perceive the situations we're asked to make decisions within? Uh, Michael mentioned the models in the natural world, and I, I wanted to put this small clipping here, not of a 
manicured garden, but of nature in its entangled and richest form. Things are wound around each other. How do we begin to make sense of this? How do we perceive it? How do we think about the way that we think? Uh, this is something that um, is a rigorous demand. I'm saying here that the way we're looking at things needs to shift. If we were to just study one thing at a time and separate our fields of knowledge, what we come up with is beautifully researched, deeply engaged information that's wildly out of context. We're very good at creating studies that, that pull things out of their natural, contextual set of interrelationships and studying them. And that is OK. The hitch is we don't put them back and see how they interact. So this, what I'm speaking of today can be applied anywhere. Um, this is the kind of thinking you can use in raising your kids and in making your breakfast. It's about how you do your job, how you organize your office. It's about how governance is put together. It's about how ecologies function. From the forest to the family to the university, we are looking at ways in which interrelating dynamics function and learn. OK? Bias is part of that. There's something about the way that we have learned to present ourselves that asks us to pretend to be objective, that the professional voice is one that says, I'm sane. I'm not going to bring my personal issues into this. This is a clear, unemotional, culturally sterile perspective that I'm going to give you. It's a voice of authority that has credibility that says, this is unbiased. But when we're looking at complex situations, I would like to reintroduce the importance of bias, the importance of understanding our own bias, the vast amount of information we miss when we don't include the subjectivity of our own frame. There's two pictures here. One, this is my window. As a sort of metaphor for um, what window are you looking through? Can we begin to become familiar with the frame through which we are looking at the world? Take a little ownership of that. Because it matters. If you look out the front window of your house and you look out the back window of your house, what you see is not the same. The frame that you are seeing through, perceiving the world through, matters. And that frame is, is colored with culture, with language, with religion, with education, with position, with relationships, with mood with age, with generation, with history. What can we begin to learn about our own frame? And then how can we begin to share that bias? What levels of information are we missing by removing intersubjectivity from our conversation? That's the, the piece, intersubjectivity. Now this other piece, you may, anybody recognize that? Um, that's the little box from the, the story of the little prince, in which the little prince asks the man to draw a sheep. And the man draws a sheep. And the prince says, that's the worst sheep I ever saw. And he draws another sheep. And he said, this is terrible. Can't you draw a sheep? What's the matter with you? And he draws another sheep. And he says, these are the worst sheep. Finally, the man gives up. He draws a box with holes. He says, the sheep's in the box. And the prince says, 
What a beautiful sheep. This is the sheep I've been looking for. Finally, somebody who can draw a proper sheep. Because there's room in that image for his sheep to exist, right? So when we're talking about complexity, it's so important that we be able to have room for multiple interpretations of the same subject. We cultivate this process. This is what I'm talking about when I say this is a rigorous future we have ahead of us. This is a kind of scientific and, and uh, educational rigor we have not yet really broached. How do we keep in mind that there are multiple descriptions? We're not looking for the truth. We're not looking for the facts. We're looking for the facts from multiple directions, the truth from multiple directions, so that we can begin to get a deeper understanding of what it is we're looking at. Okay. Ah! In the front of our world today, just for the sake of um, our discussion, let's talk about immigration. Okay? Um, I want you to know we could talk about anything right now, and we could apply this to it. But because immigration is hot, let's start there. Um, it's estimated that some 200 million people are going to be moving in the coming decades. So immigration is something we need to look at the language around. We need to get better at this. We need to figure out how, how we're going to do people movement. What are, where are we really going with this? Because right now, our discussion is lodged in various dichotomies between, for example, the struggles of local government having funds for, um, for, for the poor people and people in need at home, and how on earth they're going to pay for other people to come in. Um, religious issues, et cetera, et cetera. But we need to, in fact, expand this conversation to another level. Uh, and what I would like to do for a second is just look at these words on the, the screen here and see that we can dis take a description of immigration from any one of these directions. We can discuss immigration in terms of politics and in terms of the, the conundrums that politicians are in with the ways in which they can discuss it. How can they make policy around doing what needs to be done for the globe and doing what needs to be done for their constituents at home and at the same time appease their corporate employers? Science. Um, in immigration, we are talking about anthropology. We're talking about incredible movement and, and discovery of technology, of communication, of ways of doing research around how to create sociological harmonies. Ecology. People are moving because their ecologies are falling apart, because they're in religious conflict. Can an area really sustain what is it? There's 800,000 people moving to Germany in the next year. How, what does that affect on the ecology? The economy, of course, um, for so many reasons. Um, the most uncomfortable of which is why are they moving to begin with and how did our eco economic structures begin to create these kind of imbalances? How can we begin to take them on? Health. This is a medical issue. People look at health in different ways. And having a cultural um, viewpoint on health gives us enormous uh, leverage in the way in which we can treat people. Education, the intergenerational conversation. We forget 
that a couple of generations ago, people were moving ah, from all over the world. All right, I have to hurry up. Um, you get my point. We can describe this from many di different directions. How can we begin to create not only information, but communication that allows for this kind of cross-seeding um, of an integrated viewpoint on what something like immigration is? We could say food and have the same discussion. Food is economics, food is ecology, food is culture, food is political, food is security, food is health, food is education, food is intergenerational. This is, this is what it means to be in a complex world. We gotta get better at it. Okay, Michael, I will read this in English. Can you please translate this into French? Okay. Uh, this is a quote from my father about this process of having multiple description in our science and in the way we look at the world. At present, there is no existing science whose special interest is the combining of pieces of information. But I shall argue that the evolutionary process must depend upon such double increments of information. Every evolutionary step is an addition of information to an already existing system. Because this is so, the combinations, harmonies, and discords between successive pieces and layers of information will present m many problems of survival and determine many directions <coughs> of change. Okay. Uh, en français. Oui, oui. <laughs> En ce moment, il n'existe aucune science capable euh, spécialisée dans la combinaison de morceaux d'informations. Mais euh, j'affirme que le processus évolutionnaire dépend et doit dépendre sur ce genre de, de double addition d'informations. Chaque euh, étape évolutionnaire est l'addition d'informations à un système qui existe déjà. Parce que c'est ainsi, la combination, les, les, les combinations, les harmonies, les discordes entre euh, des éléments et des strates d'informations successives présenteront plusieurs problèmes de survie et détermineront plusieurs directions de changement. In a complex living system, it is the interdependency that gives it life. We know very little about this interdependency. We know about the parts, but we don't know so much about how the context is actually holding together. The interdependency of those interrelationships in a family, a forest, a society, a school, I'm done, um, are what we need to focus on. And I would hope for a government in which all policymakers would introduce a mandate for cross-sector information. Thank you very much. <laughs>